Jensen, what, one of the things that, that, that struck me about your research um, <coughs> was that you said that despite all of this, there had been noticeable changes and indeed improvements in the daily life of women um, in the area and more generally in rural Morocco. Um, but your conclusion was that the main driver of that was not actually legal change or change in the law or new codes, but there were actually other things that actually made a difference. Perhaps you can tell a, a little bit more about some of those. Um, I think... Um, First of all, is that a correct um, characterization of your <clears throat> finding? Um, yes and no. Um, although, I mean, there's also sort of older people would kind of talk of this, you know, they would romanticize the past, which I guess is, you know, a trait of a lot of old people the world over. Um, and um, so there was a lot of romanticization of the past. So both men, older men and women were saying how relationships in the past were actually much better between the wife and the husband. And then when I sort of asked them to explain why they were better, it sort of turned out that they were better because um, the women just didn't, didn't talk. Um, so there was sort of this idea of, of them being better. So basically everyone knew their place and that's why there was this appearance of relationships better, whereas now there's these young women that watch, for example, all these musal salats, the, the Turkish and the Egyptian and so on. So, um, and then they, you know, and then they sort of, you know, ask questions or disagree with their husbands um, that older people in particular didn't really um, sort of agree with. Um, in terms of the positive change, um, definitely, I mean, the fact that, uh, you know, the high Atlas Mountains or sort of the areas in the so-called Moroccan Util or the useless Morocco are now slowly being uh, incorporated um, in, I mean, incorporated into the state in the way that there is infrastructure that is being built there. So people are actually getting electricity, running water and so on, but not all. So, for example, the villages where I did my primary field work, um, because they were on the main road, they had all of these, you know, amenities or um, running water, sewage canals, things like that. As, as soon as you went into the villages that were, you know, even five, not more than five kilometers away from the main roads, um, they would still have generators. They would not have running water, they would not have electricity, uh, and so on. Um, so the differences were actually quite um, stark. But the fact that, um, that there was electricity actually made a huge um, difference. So it's a technological change mm -hmm. as much as anything drove yeah. a lot of the changes in relationships more than, than legal change. Yes, I think so because I think that people sort of started to be, um, started to hear other types of opinions. Um, they also heard about um, the discussions in Rabat. Uh, and so on. I would also like to um, emphasize that uh, so a lot of the women and particularly the my field site family um, sort of especially in the morning the channels that were turned on were the channels from the Gulf and these were sort of these very kind of conservative religious conservative um, uh, channels that also influenced women in the way of their sort of relationship with religion as well that may not always uh, sort of be um, balanced in a way with, with the state discourse. Um, um, and uh, especially when it comes to, for example, abandoning uh, visitations of Sufi shrines or Zawiyas uh, and so on, because they heard on the TV that this is all haram, um, that this is not what true Islam is and so on. So um, there were these kinds of, I think, technological uh, um, advancements um, that are making a real <coughs> difference. Now, um, through, the, through, you, um, through your research, um, you, one of the things I liked about your research was you, you moved out, you used what you found out about the, the Mudawana reform to look more broadly at the issue of development in rural Morocco, in rural areas. And you developed some quite interesting criticisms and quite un unexpected criticisms about where you think the current discourse, the current orthodoxy on how you develop these areas was going wrong. And could I ask you to say a little bit about what you think the big mistakes are being made mm -hmm. and what sort of things you think would actually make more of an impact? Because you were very critical, you said a lot of the main ideas about how we develop things from what I can see and what you've seen on the ground don't actually work as they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. um, 
Yeah, so a couple of, um, so I sort of challenged a few um, sort of development orthodoxies, uh, like for example, um, about the uh, female-headed households, uh, because in the development literature, female-headed households lots of times um, are introduced <laughs> as sort of the only households where, you know, women sort of struggle and so on, and it kind of seems that the development sort of the efforts uh, or a lot of the development aid is, is kind of focusing on how to help women in these female-headed households without actually uh, looking at what's happening with women within male-headed households or sort of, you know, <laughs> your ordinary households. Uh, another, um, another issue that I, um, that I also sort of challenged and that kind of came really through my field work, it was really sort of an unintentional kind of side, side effect. Uh, was the fact of um, sort of celebrating um, postponing marriage into, you know, well into adulthood. Um, and so what I found in my area was actually that a lot of the, uh, what I call in the book, um, single adult educated girls, because these were girls that were, uh, that finished um, their undergraduate degrees, some also had master's degrees, was that um, education actually hasn't brought them you know, the, the proverbial empowerment that the development uh, community, you know, claims it will bring. There's sort of this idea that, you know, all we need to do in order to empower women uh, is to give them access to education. But actually what I found <coughs> was that uh, a lot of the women, um, or Bnet, um, in, in this area, they got the education uh, and then they could not get married. Uh, they could not get a viable job. They, uh, they lived at home. Um, and, you know, they, they, they weren't independent or autonomous, uh, and actually some also regretted the fact that they continued with uh, education. Which is a deeply disturbing finding. Mm. I remember reading that and thinking, I wish she hadn't found that. Because mm. <laughs> that really goes against mm. what this is an, everybody believes, mm -hmm. that the improvement of access, particularly to, to higher levels of education, would have a liberating effect mm -hmm. on women. Now... I assume you found that as disturbing as I think everybody else yeah. did. Now, is there something positive that can come out of that to say, but actually, if we find that, this is what we need to do to correct this? Well, can I just say something that's perhaps even more disturbing mm -hmm. before moving Sorry. to the positive? No, it's okay. Um, another thing that I sort of found was talking to younger girls, so girls that were um, in high school, um, girls that were about to get married, so young girls of like 16, 17 age, and when I asked them, because there was... Girls, I mean, you know, again, I think the world over always talk about love and getting married and, and, and you know, fighting, finding, fighting, finding. Uh, maybe it's fighting. Maybe it is fighting, <laughs> exactly. Uh, the Prince Charming and so on. Um, and when I, asked, when I said, you know, but aren't you, you know, aren't you sort of, you know, very young and, you know, what about, you know, pursuing education? And they sort of said, we learned from, you know, the example of our, of our teachers. If we go and we, we get educated, we will stay single like them. And we will not be, you know, treated as fully adult. Um, we will not have access to, you know, full adulthood. Because you use this, you have this fascinating observation, the use of the word woman and the use of the word girl. Perhaps you can say something about that. Um, yeah, so... Um, I sort of at the beginning of my, my field work, I constantly sort of, you know, try to correct, like a foreigner correcting a native speaker, uh, in terms of the usage of the word uh, girl, because uh, one of my sort of field site family sisters, uh, she was 42 years old, she was single, and everyone referred to her as a bint. Um, and to me, that just didn't make any sense until they obviously explained sort of, you know, what the connotation is and so on. And the connotation being just to... The connotation uh, being that she is unmarried, uh, therefore a virgin, uh, and so that, you know, she cannot possibly be a woman, whereas there was a case of a girl that got engaged at the age of um, 13, um, and then, um, you know, they, they started to, to refer to her as, you know, almost sort of, you know, a woman. Um, and to me, that just sort of didn't make sense. But of course, uh, it makes sense in, in, in the expectations of gender roles. And this is something what I think girls, um, these younger girls, that said we don't want to end up like our female teachers that are single and virgins, that they will, you know, stay like that for their, uh, their whole lives. Um, I think that it. Um, I think that these girls understood what um, what their primary role is. Um, and on the positive. On the positive. <laughs> trying to think from positive out of what are fairly mm -hmm. disturbing findings. 
I think, um, I think a lot of these younger girls or these unmarried girls, educated girls, I think they're sort of caught in this transition period, hopefully. Um, and uh, actually, I mean, one of the positive things is that one of, um, uh, one of the main, char main characters uh, in my book, Habiba, she actually got married um, and uh, she just moved to the U.S. Um, and so on. But that was one case among a lot. So there, I mean, it's not sort of black and white and so you get <coughs> education and you don't get married. Uh, but... Um, well, for example, if you, if you, if, if um, a girl from your field site said, I would really like to go to university, mm -hmm. do you think it's a good idea? What would you say? <coughs> I mean, I'm an educator and so obviously I'm all about promotion of education. The problem is that these girls are facing all these structural problems, um, that it's not just, you know, to have an education, but then that they actually have to live in this area. And so, you know, women that are illiterate will make fun of them, uh, for example, and they have to face this on a daily basis and deal with it on a daily basis. Um, so... What can be done then? What, what, would you just say, well, we, there's nothing we could do about education mm -hmm. in these areas? Or do you think these structural factors are things that you can change? What sort of things? Say us about some of those structural factors. Yeah, um, so I come from, um, I was raised in Yugoslavia, which was a socialist country, it was also a very authoritarian country. Um, but if I got anything out of this experience was that uh, if you want to improve human development in a developing country, and Yugoslavia definitely was a developing country, sort of a, you know, a third world country, um, you have to put the state at the center of this conversation uh, and at the center of, I think, really initiating, um, sort of focusing on the roots of the issues, um, which are, um, which have to do a lot with, you know, just giving people access to basic health care, to quality education, not just free education, but quality education as well. Um, another thing that, you know, just sort of as a, you know, as a side note, um, in, this, in the area where I did my field work, there's actually lots of schools, which is great. But when you spend, I don't know how, I, I spend sort of over 100 hours in, uh, in, these, uh, in, in, in the primary schools, it sort of makes sense why Morocco continues to, um, to have these issues with um, poor literacy, with uh, students performing very badly on these international, I mean, on these um, comparative international scales uh, and so on. So it's not just having access to education, it's also um, having access to quality what, education. What sort of issues of quality did you see? Um, so there was a lot of just rote memorization against this very kind of authoritarian um, relationship between you know, the professor and, um, and students. Um, obviously lack of, um, lack of um, equipment uh, as well. I mean, what, one of sort of the anecdotes that was um, quite interesting and sort of telling as well was uh, one of my friends who was a teacher, so a female teacher in a, in a, um, in a, in a private school, um, very poorly paid. Um, she, so she complained that they have to use these um, uh, textbooks that are, that are made in Casablanca and in Rabat, and she said they're, they're produced for kids that have access to the swimming pool and that know what pizza is. And then I have to explain to my kids that have no idea, have never in their life seen um, you know, a swimming pool or even a sidewalk, for example, what this is. And so that sort of also creates uh, problems um, and issues in terms of just um, understanding uh, the learning process, for example. Um, yes, another, another interesting thing that came out, which again some people would, would find mildly disturbing, was you, as well as discussing the, the approaches to the rural areas from the women's associations, uh, particularly from the big cities, you also looked at, which I thought was very interesting, the discourse and work of the Islamist mm -hmm. organizations in Morocco. Most people would assume that this would have an entirely, a lot of people, I should say, would, would, would have the assumption, this would have an almost entirely negative effect mm -hmm. on the development of, of women's rights. And you found that actually the picture was, 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 was mixed. You, you didn't think it was as simple as that. You actually thought there was a role to play. Mm -hmm. If you can say something about that. Um, so 
I, so I also did research uh, in Rabat where I did interviews um, and sort of meetings with both secular women's rights organizations but also uh, Islamist uh, women's rights organization, um, which actually Islamist women's group, uh, which, so this was before 2012, before um, Sheikh Abdeslam Yassin died. So with the women's group that was established within the um, sort of outlawed or banned Alada Wal Ihsan, so Justice and Spirituality Movement. And that group um, I found very interesting. It was very dynamic. Uh, it was led by a very outspoken uh, woman. Um, and uh, not, and obviously also Nadia Yassin, but there was um, the, the women's section within uh, Alada Wal Ihsan was, was uh, led by, um, by a very outspoken woman with a PhD. And so one of the, I think, very important projects that unfortunately I think they kind of discontinued because after Sheikh Abdeslam Yassin died, the relationship within, relationships within the organization changed, I think quite significantly, um, was that they uh, came up with a project where they will uh, train 50, uh, 50 of their female members, all of whom have um, a PhD in various different areas, so in medicine, in sociology, anthropology, political <coughs> science, and so on, um, and uh, with the aim to, um, um, so to train them as, the, as sort of religious scholars, as women um, that have access to, uh, to, the, um, to the Quran, that have access to the other religious um, sources, and will be able to give, um, sort of to interpret these religious sources from a women's perspective. And so they looked at the issues of, for example, polygamy. They looked at the issue of um, whether wearing a hijab is you know, something that uh, is a must, or whether it's a choice for a woman. And I think this was actually very progressive, especially because when I was talking to, for example, uh, ADFM women or women from UAF, so these very secular kind of left-wing uh, women's uh, rights organization, organizations in Rabat, they sort of almost couldn't believe it because, you know, Nadia Yassin is obviously in cahoots with, with the Taliban uh, and, and so on. Um, and to me, it seemed almost sort of sad that there is not, that there isn't more conversation between the secular women's rights organizations and the Islamists, because I think that they're, what they're trying to do is actually very it's sort of parallel, and you know the the, the goal is actually quite um, the goals are actually quite um, similar, uh, even if they come from you know different um, class backgrounds, which I think lots of times is actually one of the main um, one of the main issues. So I think. Um, these conversations and the interviews that I've done with the, uh, with the, with the women belonging to, uh, or at that time, members of Alada Walafsan were actually very um, um, eye-opening. Um, and I wish that there was more conversation between them and the other women. It's very, very interesting and unusual to, 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 to talk to that range of mm -hmm. uh, groups. Perhaps you can say a little bit about the mechanics of your research, how you go about doing your research. Mm -hmm. On one level, okay, you, you identify where you want to be, and there was a time, and you, you talk about in the book, where you step off the bus <laughs> in Rashidiya province. How do you go from stepping off that bus as a, a, a PhD student from Slovenia um, to engaging with what is happening locally and trying to get an understanding of the picture of what is happening locally? Can you tell us about some of the practical issues? Mm -hmm. How did you go about that? How did, you, how did you go about finding out what was happening in this, in this rural community? Mm -hmm. So a lot of it was, um, I think my, my sort of research interests, gender rights, I think just you know, stem from my personal, um, personal interests as well. And I think that this is one of the strengths that I also, when I talk to my students, uh, you know, choose a topic of your research based on also your, your interests because, I mean, you know, especially when you're doing your master's and particularly when you're doing your PhD, it seems like you're married to your research. Um, so you do need to sort of, you know, develop, have a personal connection uh, with it. Um, field, field work as such, um, I, think, I think one of the positive things before going to field work was that I did not actually fully understand what field work means, even though I thought that I was prepared for it. Um, so, um, you know, I took courses in anthropology and methods, and I talked to, 
um, um, one of my professors who was an anthropologist and also did lots of um, field work, he also gave, so I also read a lot about various different um, ethnographic accounts, so I thought I was sort of ready of, you know, what to expect. And I was obviously very naive, but I think that that was good because otherwise I don't think that I would ever decide to do um, field work or academic work. Um, so, and then I guess once I was there, it was sort of too late to kind of drop as well uh, because, I mean, doing field work is... You I mean, know, let's concern us a little bit about when you mm -hmm. say doing field. What sort of things did you do? It means that you are living in a um, area that is not your own, um, that you, where you don't know people, where you don't know customs, where you're constantly doing something wrong because not, not consciously, but sort of inadvertently because you just don't know what sort of you know what's expected from you, um, and then people also not telling you you know that you're um, doing something wrong constantly. You're living with a family. I was living with a family, so it was. So it was. It was. It was. I mean, it's 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 your new life, um, 24/7. Um, I, you know, I was able to to sort of escape every couple of months when I went home, and I think that these breaks were actually very necessary because, not only to sort of regain my kind of um, um, sense of why I'm doing that, uh, but also because it was it was a good time to reflect on what happened, a good time to reflect on my own attitudes and sort of failures um, of being an ethnographer uh, as well. And in terms of that word ethnography, mm -hmm. what does it actually involve you doing? In, 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 I'm talking in very practical mm -hmm. terms, because mm -hmm. it's, can you tell us a little about your daily, uh, mm -hmm. your daily, daily life as a researcher mm -hmm. in, in, in this area? What sort of things are you doing? It's actually kind of a, I mean, you become a very nosy, nosy person. So you basically, um, you know, you talk to people, um, you know, out of personal interest, but obviously also with the aim of, oh, you know, this may actually be useful for, you know, my conclusions. And so, you know, you constantly have to think about how, um, you know, at the end of the day, what you're going to write about in your diary, how you're going to reflect about things, uh, and so on. So there was a lot of uh, sort of trying to remember of the conversations, dotting down um, things that will, that will remind Because what you were essentially trying to do was, was trying to get... A, a picture, or create, or, or, or uh, um, paint a picture about how attitudes and how things have evolved mm -hmm. in this community, and you get that by just having everyday conversations mm -hmm. with everybody. And I think one of the things I, 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 I really like about your research and your book is that you give voice to local people. You 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 quote at length the views of the young women teaching in the schools. Mm -hmm the women in your households, the young wives, you go and talk to the, um, the judge, you talk to all the people who make up that community and have some impact on the development of women's rights about their daily lives, and you put together this picture, and then through it, rather than telling us what, what's happened, I like the way that you've used these great quotations where you get a sense of how these people view the world and how they have viewed things that have happened, which is, which is quite remarkable. And I think field work is an attempt to try and get under the skin of a community and get a sense not about what's right and wrong and what you think, but about how they look at the world. Mm -hmm. And as we found, sometimes they look at the world in which in uncomfortable ways, mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the things of field work. And I like the way that you, 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 you took that on board, and you took very seriously what people had to say. Mm -hmm. you, you, you didn't want to say, well, that you're, you're wrong. And I think that was something that comes out wonderfully in the book. Is it a difficult process, doing field work? It is. I mean, it's very difficult because um, basically your life is your work. Um, and as I said, it's, it's constant sort of work. Even if you're just having a casualty and there was lots of tea drinking, so doing field work actually, I mean, in a way, it's also quite boring because you're just doing these, you know, ordinary things. Like, for example, waking up in the morning and then, you know, uh, baking bread. I wasn't actually allowed to clean because the ladies didn't really trust me with cleaning. Um, so when I, at, at a few, like a few times, I just took the broom and then... Ten minutes later, I saw another, so one of my um, field site sisters, um, you know, redoing what I did, and then I just dropped it. And so I was just doing a lot of, you know, sort of observing of, you know, life and being part as much as possible, obviously, uh, of, of, the li of that life and then reflecting um, on it. So, for example, drinking tea or going to aerobics classes, um, 
and yeah. And presumably you were a bit of a novelty when you first arrived. Yes. Presumably you, I, 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 I would guess you don't look like a typical person from the rest no. of your province. No, although I did um, get a couple of times if I'm from Palestine, but I think that's because it's sort of very far removed. Um, no, exactly. I mean, I definitely stood out. They, had, they have experience with foreigners because there are um, uh, Peace Corps volunteers, but they've never had um, sort of a female Peace Corps volunteer. <coughs> Nancy, what sort of things do you think that your all research, you end up with certain conclusions, but you realise there's so many more things that you could do? Are there particular things, particularly with a, at a university where there are plenty of would be researchers, I hope, what sort of things need to be looked at that come out of your project you think really need to be looked at in detail, that you weren't able to cover mm -hmm. in, your, in, in your book? Um, so one of the issues, I mean, you know, that I guess all social scientists, social scientists um, face is we're always asked with a question, but how does your small scale study, how can you generalize that over mm -hmm. Morocco? So I think having sort of more studies that would either challenge what I'm saying or, you know, sort of find similar things, I think that would definitely um, um, be worthwhile as well. Um, and then I think just look at um, sort of particular issues within uh, within the either application of the law. Uh, my current project, for example, deals with gender-based violence, uh, and um, it again, it kind of looks at, I mean, it looks at the, I mean, I always look at the politics of, of gender issues because I think that the two cannot be um, separated. Uh, but there's a various different uh, issue, I mean, there's various different sort of projects that one could look at um, in terms of, um, just the other day I was talking to a student looking, um, who wants to look at the issue of why all of a sudden so many divorces uh, in Morocco. And I think divorce is a great issue to look at, especially because there's a lot of sort of rumors surrounding the Mudawana and how the Mudawana promotes divorces uh, and, um, and, and so on. And there's a lot of sort of issues that could be explored.